Hello, Trail Seeker, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health podcast. You're going to love today's interview with Dr. Mark Sherwood. He brings some amazing information to help us heal and help get our health to the next level. You know what he said at the end of the interview? This felt like I was just chatting with my bud and it was such a great conversation. It's interesting that he said that because a lot of listeners say to me that they feel like they're sitting in the living room with us, chatting with us and just learning from our guests, ask the questions that they wanted me to ask. So it, it feels like they're part of the conversation. Learning from him in this interview reminded me of my experience with IIN, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. When I went through their year-long health coach training program, I learned from the world's best holistic health experts, functional medicine experts. It was phenomenal. And, and then I ended up interviewing many of them on the show. I had Andrea Beeman, Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Joel Furman, and I loved them all. And I had many more. Uh, you can go to my website, learntrout.com and type in Institute for Integrative Nutrition in the search function. And you'll find all my episodes where I interviewed many of the graduates, uh, the staff, like the founder and the CEO, also health coaches that have come through their program and their teachers, many of their teachers. Now, when I was considering doing the course, considering going through the year-long health coach training program with the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, I had two problems, two dilemmas in my mind. I didn't have enough time and I didn't have enough money. And what I was really surprised about is that they broke it down. So the year-long program, even incredibly busy people, can do it because it's about 20 minutes a day. So sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, but it averages out to be about 20 minutes a day. I did it while I was washing the dishes, cooking, doing the laundry. I'd just have it playing. I'd be driving. I'd listen to it. I'd be at the gym listening to it. I would just listen to whenever I could, I would turn it on. Just kind of like you're listening to this show. You fit it in. Maybe while you're driving, you'd be, if you, if you can listen to a podcast, you can do the program. You can go through their program. So that eliminated that first dilemma for me. And then the second dilemma was I don't have enough money and it is a incredibly rich program. And so of course it's, it, 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 it costs money, right? It's not, it's not cheap, but it's also they deliver so much value that at the end of it, I was like, this was worth every penny. And what I loved is they give a discount to my listeners, which is amazing because I talked to the founder and I talked to the CEO and I talked to some managers there and I asked them if they could please give a discount to the listeners of my show. And they do. So if you do want to go forward and, and check it out, Make sure you get the discount, the Learn Your Health podcast with Ashley James. Make sure you get the discount. But what was great was that I signed up with the payment plan. I was like, okay, that eliminated my last barrier to entry for me. And I was able to jump in and do it because I had a toddler at the time. I was working full time. Go, 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 go. I was so busy and yet I was able to afford it on a payment plan. I was able to do it about 20 minutes a day. I was able to fit it in. And I got so much out of it. Imagine like how great the content is on my show and condense that into TED Talks, like and how great some TED Talks are. And it's like every time I would sit down to, to learn, it would just be these amazing, amazing health lectures that were so well thought out and so well taught that I got so much information out of it. And I was really surprised at how much my life transformed. And then I was able to spill that over and help my friends and family. And of course, then go on to help others. About half the people that take the program don't ever intend to work with clients and be, be an actual health coach. They just want the tools for themselves and their family and their friends. Uh, or they just want those tools because that is for themselves alone. And then maybe it'll be a great addition to whatever they're doing in life. You learn how to help people on so many levels, you learn how to communicate with people and really listen to people and help people on so many levels. It's incredibly rewarding. So if you'd like to check out IIN, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, you can get a free sample class by going to learntruehealth.com slash coach. That's learntruehealth.com slash coach. Check it out. See if it's for you. If it's for you, you can give them a call or you can, I believe you just go to the IIN, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition's website. And I think they have like an ability to chat with them there. But go ahead and just check it out for free. First of all, just go get the sample class and see if it's for you and just, just dive in and look at it. It was amazing for me. Now, if you have more time on your hands, let's say about a, 
40 minutes to an hour a day and you'd like to become a health coach sooner, they have a six month program. And recently in the last year, they've spent a year really uh, working at this and they have completely revamped their whole program. It's so exciting. It's just amazing. So if you geek out on health stuff, just like I do, and you're also into personal growth and development, this class is for you. And I love that people do it all around the world. You get this big sense of community because you actually participate with people around the world. There's nothing quite like it. I actually remember crying, just bawling my eyes out, like good tears, good, happy tears. The entire first day I was taking the class because I felt like I'd finally found my tribe. Like I'd finally found the people that would understand me. And it was such a good feeling to be a part of that a part of that experience. And at one point you actually get to do coaching calls with a group of people and you get to, you can connect with people locally, like in your state or province or your, your, your territory, your area that are going through the program as well. So you, you can make friends and you feel like, wow, you're not the black sheep anymore. Like there's a bunch of other people who are also just totally geeking out on health stuff and personal growth stuff and, and uh, emotional healing stuff. Uh, it's just, it's fascinating. So check it out. You know, this, this interview today, Dr. Mark Sherwood just reminded me so much of, of how much I got out of IIN. And so if you just love this interview, you'd probably also love their program. Make sure you go to learntrout.com slash coach, sign up for the free program and just see if you even like it. Even if you're not interested in signing up, you, you get a free, free sample class, go get it, go, maybe you'll get something out of it. Anyways, I know you're going to get something out of this episode. So enjoy today's interview. Thank you so much for sharing this podcast with those you care about. Hey, if this interview or if any of my interviews were shared to, to you by one of my listeners, they really care about you. And that's saying something because we have to help each other, right? There's too many people sick out there. 70% of the adult population is on at least one prescription medication. We're walking around thinking that health is disease management. And that's not the case. It's just up, up is down, left is right. You know, it's everything is backwards in this world because true health is being symptom free and off of drugs. True health is feeling amazing, jumping out of bed full of energy. True health is having longevity and if you do get sick, you recover like you recover like that. You recover so fast. That's true health. And I want you to have that. And you can have that. I've watched people heal from things that they were told by doctors they could never heal from, including myself. And I want you to have that. So keep listening. Keep sharing the episodes with those you care about. Let's help our friends and family to learn true health and to experience true health. Enjoy today's episode. Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 483. I am so excited for today's guest. We have Dr. Mark Sherwood on the show. The website to go to is Sherwood.tv. And I just want to point out that he has a great free download. It's an ebook. It's about 27 pages and it has some fantastic protocols in there and it also will show you what is possible the healing that is possible for you mark i'm such a huge fan of the work that you and your wife do because your mission statement is right on par with my mission statement to eliminate all unnecessary usage of medication to eradicate all self-imposed choice driven disease and the thing is, a lot of people are walking around not knowing that their choices have led to their disease. That's what happened to me in my 20s. I developed a lot of diseases and, and then I um, and then I in my 30s uh, eradicated them all with my choices. But I was walking around like going with the flow, not being a salmon. I wasn't going upstream. I was doing what everyone else was doing. And I <laughs> developed a bunch of diseases. And then I had to turn around and be a salmon and go totally against the flow. And that's when I eradicated my diseases. So so a lot of people don't know. And, and sometimes they might get offended. Like, I didn't give myself fibromyalgia. Or I didn't give myself MS. I didn't give myself autoimmune disease. Um, so it's not that some... So that we're not saying that people consciously chose to give themselves that, but their choices have led to the state that they're in. And, and that also is very empower. Um, I don't want to use the word empowering. That is also uh, allows them to step into their power 
when they realize that they are now in control. And today, Dr. Sherwood is going to teach us that you are in control. You, all your MDs have been giving you drugs and telling you that you are going to have that disease for the rest of your life. And it's not true. You can heal. And your choices really do make a difference. Welcome to the show. It's so exciting to have you here today. Ashley, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I appreciate what you do. I appreciate your show and I appreciate, you know, the audience that you draw. I know people want to learn, so I'm excited today. It's going to be great. Absolutely. Can you start by sharing your story? What happened in your life that led you to become the doctor that you are today? You know, my story is quite unique, actually. Um, during my childhood years, I was not brought up in a healthy environment at all. Um, didn't know anything about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was so unhealthy physically, uh, emotionally that, um, you know, I went through a tragedy in my life, um, early two thousands that unexplainable, but it was the suicide of my own mother. It was, it was mm -hmm. that traumatic. Um, but you know, during the trauma, I was determined to learn a few things on how not to, to do that in my own life. Um, even though I didn't learn it, it didn't really come to full fruition until probably, the late 80s, uh, when I find myself on the other side of the world in the country of Australia playing professional baseball. And um, I had nothing to do during the day except um, sit around and wait for the games in the evening. But I decided to start exercising. And before I knew it, I realized there was something to this. And then shortly thereafter, I, my career um, – I, I joined the police department in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma – and was put in charge of a wellness program. I'm speeding up the story, but you get the idea. And I didn't know what I knew now. I wondered why my colleagues were dying so quickly, and mm. I wanted to figure that out. So I, I started to really get into the idea of, does stress really have to have this much effect on us? And what effect does nutrition have in our lives? And how do those two relate? And, and do they relate? So I went on that quest, if you will, Ashley, to determine the answers to those questions. Is our lifestyle creating um, this increase of this thing I call six span? And that led me down the pathway of naturopathic study. And I was always a fan of that because it made sense. You know, I thought, okay, if we can take care of ourselves physically, emotionally, spiritually, what does that mean? Because I knew that enough at the time that the conventional medicine, this allopathic medicine wasn't working. It was a miserable failure and it has been for what, 60 years now. We can look at that simply based upon evidence. We are now growing diseases much, much faster than we're growing people. We have seen disease processes like heart disease and um, type two diabetes and autoimmune conditions, uh, as you were speaking of earlier, that have absolutely skyrocketed. And so when I look at the system and I looked at the system, then I realized that doesn't work. And I wasn't going to continue to practice insanity, as Einstein said, to continue to go on the same pathway, do the same thing, expect a different result. So I, I went on a, a mission to find out what I could learn about the human body and its interaction with the environment we live in and other people and, and nutrition and medicine that's put inside of food. And I, I really wanted to understand why, why that why question was the thing that drove me and it still does. And so, you know, that kind of began the journey. And now, you know, all these years later, uh, we're still learning. We're still asking, asking why. Uh, but the most important thing to understand is we're seeing literally thousands of people around the world get well. And I, I can't be more grateful than that. I'm, I'm thankful to God that he gives us the wisdom and the knowledge and the ability to do that. Uh, and I'm so happy for people to get well. That's what drives us every day. What were your colleagues dying of uh, when you were on the police force and you started to notice that, that, that they were dropping like flies? Well, this is an interesting statistic that's been around for um, probably five decades that few people are aware. Uh, the average male police officer, and this is an FBI study, the average element, average male police officer who did 20 years of service, and this is back in, I believe, the 70s that was done, um, the average age of death was 66 years of age, and which is substantially oh lower gosh. than the expected age, right? And so in my own city, and this brings me back to the early 2000s, 
um, I did a study of the officers that had died, and I did the same analysis that the FBI, FBI did, just a smaller, um, a smaller group. And I found that the average life expectancy for a 20-year retired male police officer was 65. And mm -hmm. so I thought to myself, something is wrong with this. But they basically, because of shift work, you get a lot of cortisol, you get a lot of blood pressure issues, weight issues, metabolic disorders, uh, blood sugar issues, depression, sleep issues. And so they were on all these medications and eventually they'd end up dying of things like cancers or heart disease. So that was the predominantly two causes. Which are like the, the two major causes of death in the United States. That's right. And so right. that led me as you um, picked up there, I looked at the major two causes of death in the U.S. and I found the same thing. And I said, OK, well, this must be uh, hitting everybody because I used to think that only police officers and military had PTSD. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, wait a minute, it's everybody that's had trauma and drama in their lives, mm -hmm. you know, and so all that put together um, in a big mess bucket, if you will, was one of the things that I said, you know what, I can do something about this. I'm going to believe that if people knew the information, if they know how to do this and know how to reverse, they're going to do it. And so on this information quest, I learned as much as I could to communicate then in an effective manner, this concept of hope. And so now we've kind of coined the phrase, if you will, my wife, Michelle, and I, who I get to work with every day, you know, we are hope dealers, a hope dealer. And we give that away every day. And I'm, uh, I pray that the listeners will, during the course of our time, gather and grab onto that hope. So MDs are drug dealers. <laughs> they are. They really are. And Michelle and Mark Sherwood are hope dealers. That's right. And it's funny, my wife, you know, and this this is interesting. You know, she came from the conventional system because she's an osteopath as well. Uh, so interestingly enough, she had a drug rep actually call her um, a drug whore. That's <gasps> what, that was the word. And, and you know, um, we still look back at that in shock and awe and horror. But also we looked at it like, you know what? That's exactly what that is because mm. – and, and I want everybody to kind of gather this. When you go to the conventional doctor, they are looking for what's wrong. What's wrong? Right. There's something wrong with that question. When people come in here and they want to know what's wrong, I say, wait a minute. Let's turn this around. Let's first look at all the things that are right about you. And so we don't let them go down that pathway. So therefore, our diagnostics are not looking for diseases. They are going upstream to look for the root causes of symptoms that are named diseases or disease categories. Right. Well, MDs break the body down. Allopathic medicine is breaking the body down into its parts and then treating it with a drug. So they're not seeing the body as a whole or, or, or finding the root cause. And that's and that's that's the problem is that they're uh, philosophically the lens that they look through is so different from a, a naturopathic standpoint, right? The lens that they look through governs their choices and where they're, what tests they're going to run and how they're going to interpret those tests. If you took the same tests to an MD that you took to an ND, a naturopathic physician or a functional medicine practitioner, a holistic practitioner, the, the MD will say, oh, your, your, your vitamin D is at 35 okay we're good with that whereas a as long as it's below 30 i'm fine that's what the md says or or if it was above 60 they go oh you're 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 toxic you have to stop taking your your vitamin d they don't have any training around nutrition they don't have that training on how to uh prevent disease and how to reverse disease they have their training lies in pharmacology they're wonderful diagnosticians they're fantastic at diagnostic diagnosing and at and at um treating symptoms or, or ma making sure the body uh shifts into like with drugs it pushes the body in one direction right but they are not trained in reversing disease and supporting the body's ability to heal itself. That is a very good statement. I agree with all of that. And additionally, we need to understand that and that all drugs 
for the most part, have – these are not side effects. These are actual effects. Yes. But they will pull out various vitamins mm-hmm. and minerals and nutrients. And therefore, when you look at that, you say, okay, well, for example, let's use one drug, the, the drug metformin. Oh. It's always given to people for blood sugar issues to create more insulin uh, sensitivity, in other words. So somebody's A1C, hemoglobin A1C, is running at 6 or 7 or whatever, or 6.1, look slightly over the, the normal, quote-unquote, normal range. And so they're going to go on metformin. Well, when you go on metformin, it may help with blood sugar, but it pulls out also um, vitamin B12 and also uh, folate. Now, vitamin B12 and folate are critical factors in the methylation cycle. So if you pull those out of the methylation cycle, you know, again, metformin is looked at as this anti-aging drug. But let's think about this from a holistic standpoint. If we pull out vitamin B12 and folate from the methylation cycle, we render the methylation cycle ineffective about creating Mm. methyl groups. Methyl groups are in charge of, in a nutshell, um, Repairing DNA, um, maybe helping create neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, uh, and also driving down the transsulfuration cycle, which is going to be uh, creating of glutathione. So we would be, in effect, inhibiting glutathione production, nutrient transmitter or neurotransmitter production. So that could be leading to uh, toxicity issues, oxidative stress issues, or even depression issues. Cancer. Cancer, that's right. So it's like it, something is has got to change in the paradigm over the course of time or, or we're doomed to being stuck in that system. And that system mm-hmm. is not going to create wellness because it's like going to, uh, you know, a person, a male going to a suit store. I'm going to buy a suit. I'm going to go over here and the first thing I'm going to do is try on a pair of pants. Well, then you're going to go over here from the pants department to go to the jacket department, but the jacket department person is going to say, I don't care what the pants department said. That's their department, and they're going to get a mismatch, right? And you get the idea it's going to go from the shirt to the tie of the shoes, and you're going to have just a mismatch of stuff that looks terrible. That's what a body looks like when it goes through that system. It looks terrible, and I could go on and on with examples <laughs> such as that. It reminds me of a, of a story I just heard about um, – I think it's one of my listeners just shared with me that her mom has kidney problems and heart problems. And the heart doctor said, you have to eat less meat. And the kidney doctor said, you have to eat more meat. Right. And, uh, and so it's like, okay, so one diet is going to cause her kidneys to fail, but her heart will be better. And the other diet is going to cause her kidneys to be healthy, but her heart, you know, and so anyways, just back and forth. And so the doctors, she said, wait a second, you guys are giving me the opposite diets. Now, Medical doctors are not trained in in nutrition. They get something like 20 hours of nutrition unless they, after graduating medical school, go on to take further courses and and actually like dive into the studies, which we'd hope that doctors would continue to look at the the latest science and studies um, around diet because it makes sense that everything we put in our mouth is either either hurting us or harming us or Mm -hmm. hurting us or healing us. Um. And, and so that there's, there's the dilemma, right? There's there's a lot of confusion around, around diet. Now you mentioned heart disease and cancer, uh, being the two top killers, uh, of, of, you know, police officers after they retire, but also that those, that's what the major, the two major causes of disease are in the United States or the cause of death are. And I recently had Dr. Richard Fleming on the show, episode 463. He's a research cardiologist. He's not a holistic doctor at all. He's 100% all about the drugs. But what I love about his work is he, he, he dives into the research. And so for the last 30 years, he's been looking at the cause, the root cause of uh, cardiovascular disease. And he also did studies on cancer and heart disease and found that really the root cause was inflammation. Right. And years, years, years before a cancer will appear on a scan, you can see the inflammation that's there beforehand. Same with heart disease. So if we're, we're really what we're doing is we're looking to decrease uh, to mitigate um, all the things in our life that cause the inflammation. Uh, my question because we could definitely talk about foods that help, you know, yeah. foods that harm and foods that help, right? We could definitely talk about herbs and supplements. But you mentioned the the emotional aspect. And my question is, 
uh, like like sleep, like uh, the doc- the 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 police who are on altered schedules. I'm sure there's lots of listeners who have to do the second or third shift, and so their their sleep is disrupted, or maybe they go to bed at one in the morning. The sleep dysregulation and em- also emotional trauma. Do those play a significant role in increasing inflammation in the body? They do. And let me explain to people in a way they'll understand and in this concept. So let's look at both of those. When you when you have trauma or drama or uh, you, you perceive stress. Now, stress doesn't have to be real to create this response. You can have this perceived stress, you know, because you can think about something. It creates the same response as if you're going through it. So we all understand that. Um, so let's, let's key in to the hormone called cortisol, which comes in second after this short acting adrenaline goes and does its thing. And then cortisol is produced. So cortisol knows the stress hormones produce when we have these stressful occurrences. And that's originating from the sympathetic nervous system arousal side, as opposed to the parasympathetic nerve nervous system arousal side, which is relaxation. So this yin and yang, if you will, this rest, stress, rest, stress should be balanced. But when we're living perpetually in a cortisol driven mode, which can come through stress and emotional um, lack of resilience or non-resilience, we, we combine this with the lack of sleep. Now, a lack of sleep, think, let's think about this, whether you're shift work or just not sh- sleeping, we have this uh, opposite effect of melatonin and cortisol. So if you're not sleeping, uh, melatonin should be up, but it's not. Cortisol is up. So cortisol is elevated when we don't sleep as well. In both cases, cortisol being a glucocorticoid, kind of sounds like glucose, it will elevate glucose because the body can't digest food when you're under stress like that. Our genes have changed 2%. That's it, actually, in 10,000 years, 2%. Mm. So when the body is perceiving stress or going through stress and synthesizing cortisol from the adrenals, the body's going to interpret that as if it's being chased by a saber-toothed tiger trying to eat it. And so there's several things that happen in that. We see blood pressure going up, of course, muscle tension going up, perspiration going up, tightness going up, and we see digestion going down. And this is a big deal right here because when we see that glucocorticoid coming up, it's going to create some sort of a blood sugar because it has to drive the body because you can't get it from food digestion. You don't have time to stop and eat while a saber-toothed tiger is chasing you. So what happens is glucocorticoid comes up blood sugar, the pancreas secretes the insulin to match it, and insulin becomes perpetually elevating, creating fat storing all the time. So this constant stress creates a lot of fat, Mm -hmm. belly fat, I call it cortisol belly. Too much fat tissue on the frame is a home for toxins. Too much fat tissue also creates this endocrine disruption, creating more inflammation, and the beat goes on. So when you look at this whole metabolic process, this whole obesity crisis that we're having, you can drive at least in part back to this emotional uh, lack of resilience and even lack of sufficient sleep. And of course, that leads us into this idea of comfort food eating, which is going to be, everybody can relate to that eating the, the classic standard American diet, which perpetuates the same thing. And it kind of is a snowball if you get my drift. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, that, I, I remember that snowball so well. I remember I was studying for – I was working towards my black belt, and I was going to the dojo four days a week, um, and sometimes five days a week. Sometimes I'd do it on the weekends. Also, we do, like, clinics, like, all day Saturday kind of thing. I just remember I was working out like crazy – But I'd stopped eating the way my mom – so I was raised in a household to eat the way our naturopath told us to eat. And I was super healthy until I rebelled as a teenager. Um, But while I was studying – and I was 19, I was was studying um, karate, I I started eating like all the black belts because I thought – I wanted to mimic them. I wanted to model them. Mm -hmm. So we'd all go to Subway. And this was my first time eating wheat and cheese since I was – before I had seen an H-Path when I was five years old. 
So all of a sudden I'm eating prop white bread or, or I think they oh. did whole bread, but it was whole, whole wheat, but whatever, whatever the difference isn't really that great. It's processed bread, cheese, processed meat, and maybe some lettuce and some tomatoes. And I remember for the first time in my life having heartburn, but I was, oh, yeah. I was just planning on eating exactly like how my sensei and Shihan and all the black belts and brown belts were eating because I just wanted to model them and, and be excellent. And I, and I just started to pack on the pounds. I gained about uh, 50 pounds a year um, very quickly. And I was exercising like mad. And I thought, what is going on here? And my my mom passed away of cancer um, mm. uh, two, two years later. So I, uh, I didn't, I didn't really sit down to, to like, think think this through like my diet has caused this like i was just i was just you know in go 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 mode but it mm. got worse and worse i developed uh, chronic adrenal fatigue type 2 diabetes chronic monthly infections for which i was on antibiotics for um i had polycystic ovarian syndrome infertility i was told after a battery of tests by an endocrinologist that i'd never have children mm. And then it was so I then spent years just eating takeout and whatever, right? Totally forgetting that I had all this wonderful health because I in my early years because I I ate just like our nature path told us to um, until 2008 when I watched with my husband. We it was one of the first streaming videos, uh, streaming movies on um, Netflix in 2008. They just started streaming. And watched, you know, like Forks Over Knives and all the, like those health ones. And what stuck for me was shop the perimeter of the grocery store and eat organic. And in our first month of doing that, I, uh, my chronic infections went away. And I still, mm -hmm. I still was miserable. I still felt horrible in my body. Um, but at least I was off of antibiotics. And so I just kept searching and searching and searching. And that's when I found nature paths that became my mentors um, and, and switching switching my diet, taking the right supplements, uh, ch changing, changing my, my mindset, all of that. I er eradicated all those diseases conceived naturally. And, and, and so for me, that's why I started the show. I started the show because it's, it, ev everyone who's suffering doesn't need to be suffering. 70% of the U S adult population is on at least one prescription medication and they've been told they have to be on it but they but the thing is most prescriptions uh, they don't we don't have to be on it we can get so healthy we don't need it so that's why i love the work that you do because you're yeah. you want to show people that they can get so healthy and and absolutely it's possible to get so healthy that they no longer need drugs now you brought up metformin and i want to point out that one of my friends who often comes to me for help um, she was in and out of the hospital spending, she lived in a hospital more. This was about two years ago. She spent more time in a hospital than she did out for mm. acute pancreatitis. And I remember her just being like, she had lost 80 pounds. She was only, she was on a liquid diet. She was in such bad shape from this, from the pancreatitis. And I said to her, I'm like, I, I didn't think she was on any meds. I didn't know. And then I said, hey, just tell me, you know, are you, what are you taking? Are you taking anything? Like, let's figure this out. Why, why do you have pancreatitis? And that's when she told me she was on metformin. And, I, and I'm like, why are you on metformin? Like, she doesn't have diabetes. What's going on right. here? And her doctor did that thing. Oh, it's good for longevity. It'll prevent it later on if you, you know. Oh, my gosh. So I said, this is why I say to all my clients, let go, go to the actual dr far, far, uh, drugs website, right? Go to the, the, far, the, Go to the website that manufactures that drug and go to the full list of side effects. Not the like little, you know, WebMD, like here's the common ones. Go to the one that shows you the entire list of side effects. And again, they're not side effects, they're effects, right? That you may mm -hmm. or may not get. Um, and then read, read through them. And sure enough, acute pancreatitis was one of the causes. But here's what surprised me. Do you know that uh, a side effect of um, metformin can be hyper hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia right. the very reason why they gave it to you it actually can cause those problems which is blows my mind so but you're and it changes all those pathways in the body it depletes us of all the, the nutrition yep. 
making us more sick. So then we need to be on more drugs, right? And uh, so I just have a very big distrust. Now, drugs have their place when they can save my life. And I want people to always use the best tool in the toolbox. I'm not, I'm not like crazy, right? Like, like I'm all like if there's a tool that's gonna save my life, I'm gonna use it. The problem is MDs are only taught to use hammers, right? So everything looks like a nail. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that it's, right. it ha- we, right. we have to make sure that we hire a whole team of professionals to support us. Right. So, so that's why I love the work you do. I would hire you. I would hire, uh, I would hire a chiropractor. I would hire an acupuncturist. You know, I'd hire a whole mm-hmm. team. Right. And then all of them would inform me on how I should, what choices I should make for my body instead of just going to an MD and then letting them, Going to an MD to tell me what to eat is like is like asking my plumber to do the wiring in my house. So, because they, they don't that's that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> you can you can keep that one. So so um, your your wife is an osteopath. I'd love to hear a bit about her journey through seeing seeing holistic medicine through the the lens that you see it through. When I went to an osteopath for the first time, I had a really bad, I think maybe a, an ovarian cyst was popping or something. I don't know, but I had an excruciating pain and I was worried something was wrong with me. Like maybe I was having a um, atopic pregnancy or something. And I went to an osteopath and he stood there with, holding his prescription pad, ready to prescribe me a pain med. Now I'm from Canada I live in the States now, but I'm from Canada. And in Canada, they don't give out pain meds like candy, right? So uh, or at least they didn't when I was growing up. So he was like, okay, so we're going to give you a pain med. I'm like, I'm not here for a pain med. I'm in pain, but pain tells me that there's something wrong. I don't want to just like numb it. I was really surprised. I thought going to an osteopath would have been more holistic, but he was just ready to to, to write me a prescription and make me comfortable. So, so your wife, is a is an osteopath but what happened that had her see the the holistic medicine versus allopathic medicine and in terms of how she can help her patients well her story is quite unique she um you know she was homeless believe it or not at one time and um working as a massage therapist trying to get by and um and her story by the way is depicted in a in a just released movie, believe it or not, called The Prayer List. So I encourage people to go there. I didn't think about that before we went live, but that's a cool movie. It's called The Prayer List. Wonderful story. Um, But during that time, she uh, had a massage client say, you know, you're, you got more to your life. Come on. Not that massage is bad, but she paid for first year school. So my wife had this healing in her mind background and thought, I'm going to go back and be a doctor and really heal people. Nice. So she graduates um, with honors. Turns out she's the valedictorian in her class and just a, a wonderful comeback story. She was in martial arts too, by the way. Um, but she got into the system. This is back in the early 2000s. And she'd been in the system for a couple of years and she began to show her patients, you know, how to cook, how to eat and all that stuff. And then she was chastised by her um, fellow um, clinicians and even her bosses about how that's not how we do it here. And she still persisted, (laughs) not because she knew it was she was rebelling against them, but she just knew it was right. Well, it turns out after being in the system for about three years, she was fired. She was let go because um, she wasn't contributing adequately to the payer mix and people didn't need to see her as much because she had that kind of a healing mindset Mm. going in. And so they fired her. She couldn't find a job anywhere for like six months. And so it really put her in a tailspin and then um, hence the birth of the Functional Medical Institute, you know, and so she kind of went into it kind of backwards and it's been interesting because some of her colleagues that she went to school with now come to see us as patients and they're like, Oh my gosh. You know, we, we <laughs> it's like the, the irony of it all. Mm. <laughs> so how did you how did you two meet? So she she had her own path leading to holistic medicine, yeah. as did as did you. How, how did the two of you come uh-huh. together to work together? Well, so when she um started when she, you know, she got into medicine basically um, because of those reasons I stated. But 
she had um, uh, really bad experiences with uh, with men, quite frankly, you know, and uh, like a lot of women have. And, you know, she was abused and treated badly. And the whole mm. story is in the in the movie and uh, basically swore off men because men hadn't treated her well at all. Um, with that said, I had came through a very uh, horrific divorce where I became the sole custodian for my two four and six year old child respectively. And so basically I swore off women. I'm not going back through that anymore. And, uh, you know, so about 10 years go by where I'm just kind of like doing my thing and she's doing her thing. And then one day we met and uh, it was the very first meeting we, we'd met. And, um, I, I saw something in her actually that was just unique and there was a draw there. And, there were people around, and I, I said to her, Dr. Neal, that's her maiden name, Dr. Neal, I appreciate the conversation with you. Um, definitely enjoyed it, and I stuck out my hand to shake her hand because chivalry is not dead in my world. And so when I shook her hand, it was the – and this is really a – truly happened. I couldn't let go of her hand. It was the oddest thing in the world. <laughs> couldn't let go of her hand, and she couldn't let go of mine, and it was this really awkward um, – few moments there and it was so awkward that other people were like looking at us and we were looking at each other and we're like I don't know what's going on but for some reason my hand is glued to your hand and and so I just heard this voice inside me say Mark would you please have some courage for once in your life dude seriously ask her out you know and, and so I did I asked her if she would um go to dinner with me and she said Yes, and so exchange numbers, and um, we really, since that first dinner, have not been apart since. It truly was love at first sight, and and since then, it was like, you know, that that equally yoked, that common theme, that healer mentality, that healer gift that we all have. Um, it just it just multiplied, and we just feed off of each other, and it we encourage one another. And she's my best friend, and mm. my I call her my queen, you know, right? So we. We have this interaction. We work together in the clinic, and people love that. You know that I will show public display of affection. I will give her a hug and a kiss right in the middle of the workday, multiple times. Because, <laughs> and it's interesting because you know we can't imagine not working together, and and it's been kind of cool because people come here and they come here because we're a couple, right? Mm. And uh, it's inspiring to them because today, obviously, there's a lot of horrible relationships that are people are in and decisions they made um, that have affected their lives, much like the, you know, a few moments ago we were talking about the stress and trauma and drama. Well, many times that comes from relationship, doesn't it? So we give them a, a sense of hope in that area too. And um, every time I'm speaking, you know, literally, whether it be in front of 5,000 people uh, live or a podcast that's audio only to thousands, millions of people around the world, I'm always going to, one, thank God for the opportunity to be here, and number two, honor my wife because she is my my backbone. I say she's not my spare rib. She's my <laughs> prime rib. So that, that's kind of how we met there. Long story short. I love it. That's beautiful. Well, you know, it, 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 makes, it, it makes a difference in the work that you do. You, um, you both bring your backgrounds to – to the medicine that you practice. So let's, let's dive in. Now, now that we have an understanding of the philosophy, the lens in which you see our, our body, our human body, right? That our spiritual, our emotional health and our lifestyle, like when we go to bed, right? Really do, does play a role in our health along with what we eat. Um, let's talk about how we can eliminate the usage of unnecessary medication and how we can eradicate all self-imposed choice driven diseases. Well, as you mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the main issue that we see within heart disease and really all other disease conditions is this thing called inflammation and it's chronic systemic inflammation. And if people can grasp this one concept I'm going to share right now, it will absolutely set you free uh, because the immune system's unique, 
the immune system is one that's like surveillance. It, it's like the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guard, Space Force, all combined, magnified. So it has internal surveillance, external surveillance. It's always looking for something that might be an enemy intruder. And we all understand the um, inducement of the immune system being from the idea of parasites, bacteria, and certainly today's world virus. We, we understand that. The immune system will respond. And the immune system, when it responds like that, it will send out signals or some, another word for that is cytokines. And some of the cytokines are inflammatory cytokines. So that's how we get this idea of inflammation. We also know that when we have an injury or something like that, like a cut or a bruise or a broken bone, we get inflammation. But the greatest inducer of the immune system that creates the most inflammation is the standard American diet, because it's got chemicals, it's got genetic modification and all kinds of pollutants in it that the body looks at as foreign. So just the very intake of a burger and fries is something that the body looks at is like, holy crap, I haven't seen that before. What is that? And that's sending a shockwave through the system, and it's not food. It's an enemy invader. So therefore, we have this chronic bombardment of this inflammatory driving system that contributes to all these diseases we see. And in our clinic, when we get people off of that, bring back just the concept of real food. You know, if, if God packaged it like this, it's probably how you eat it. And we don't give people dietary restrictions. We don't even tell them to count calories. We just say if it's on this list of anti-inflammatory foods that we generally believe, then eat it as much as you want. If it's on this list of inflammatory foods, don't eat it, any of it. And guess what? 100% of the people get better. And they're like, well, that was easy. And I, yeah, it's not that hard. So that's kind of our philosophy in practice, and that's the very first place we go. Can you give us homework to help decrease inflammation? Like, like let's, let's dive into the actionable steps we can take. All right. So let's, let's first of all look at a list, and I hope everybody gets their pen and paper out or your phone and just begin to take this down. What are some known inflammatory foods? Well, some of these are going to be really obvious and some of them not so obvious. And I'll explain why. So the obvious ones are going to be like processed foods, fried foods, uh, artificial sweeteners, uh, sugars, MSG. We know those things are going to be inflammatory. We would include sodas in there. But let's look at like corn, soy, and grains. What about non-GMO organic corn or soy grown in our own backyard? Like is that is that going to also be inflammatory no matter what? Um, or does it like a store-bought, not organic, not non-GMO? Like is, is, it, is there a difference or should we, should we avoid soy and corn no matter what? There is a difference, and in your case with an, uh, a non-GMO soy and a non-GMO organic uh, corn, those would be just fine and beneficial because they're in their natural state. What makes corn, soy, and grain so damaging is really multiple things, inclusive of the following. The genetic modification is one of them, specifically in the, uh, in the wheat crop, the grains. Uh, they've been genetically modified to avoid the effects of the herbicide Roundup. And Roundup is sprayed on the soy, the corn, and the grains. And, of course, those are subsidized by the U.S. government. And so you got to think about this from that standpoint. If the government tells you to do something in regard to your health, you probably need to do the opposite. So with the genetic modification, we have problem number one that's glaring. When these grains specifically come into our body, even though they've only been genetically modified a small percentage, the genes, again, haven't changed but 2% in 10,000 years. So it's still looking at this newfound genetically modified seed, grain crop, different. So it looks at it as a foreigner. So therefore, we get that immune system inducement. And that's why so many people have so much problem with grains, creating this idea of leaky gut or hyperpermeability of the gut, leading to autoimmunity. We also see when those genetically modified grains are digested, they become exorphins, E-X, 
O-R-P-H-I-N-S, which turn around and bind to the opioid receptors in our brain, Mm -hmm. creating a chemical addiction. And so this is why people have a hard time giving up the bread and the grains, because we're talking about a real, live, genuine addiction. So that's problem number one. Same, That's right. Same dairy. With dairy. There's su- there's the sugars in dairy that also trigger that same op- like opioid response, the dopamine, because uh, it's to make the baby right. Milk, m- m- mammal milk is meant for the baby, and the yep. baby we got to get we got to trick the brain into wanting to keep eating so it grows, and so a baby's brain is is hooked on this mo- its mother's breast milk for a very good reason. God is smart. Yeah, it's like the, it creates comfort and peace, and that's why a baby can be crying until the baby latches onto that nipple, and it's like, oh, that makes them happy. Well, yeah. it's not just the milk. It's the chemistry within the process. And mm-hmm. so, you know, that's why it's interesting, you know, the old saying was that milk does the body good. No, it doesn't. Don't. Drink it, period. And you got a double whammy there with milk because the cows in the confined animal feeding operations are – fed this corn soy wheat products to get fat fast Mm -hmm. the antibiotics and the hormones so we're selling them by weight not by health and therefore when they put out that milk i mean that's fat so this stuff is carried in the fat and toxins are stored in the fat so you have this this milieu of just a mess in in this that subsidized and again the government subsidizes dairy again so uh, but all that is problem sort of number one you know, and problem number two is you got Roundup. I mean, in itself, mm-hmm. think about the concept of glyphosate and atrazine, you know, known carcinogen, known estrogenic compound. Why are pe- people getting so fat so fast? Why are we seeing the feminization of our world in front of us? It's because of these compounds and chemicals binding to the estrogen receptors, creating the same mimicking effect of estrogen. So we see this troubling trend across our country in the United States specifically, but it's lending itself across the world as well. So, you know, these things are as bad as I just described, as inflammatory as I just described, and even much, much more. And when we talk about this with other people, we're just saying, stay away from it. I know what you've been heard. And you're, you could take this argument over here to an allopathic side, and the majority of them are going to say, oh, that's nonsense. But it is true. It is Everything I just said is true. And you can, folks, you can look it up out there, and there's all kinds of studies on that that you can see in the way it works. It's out there. It's not hidden from you. Mm-hmm. Uh, just search it out and see that it's actually accurate. I just read a recent study, really fascinating. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not a, uh, advocate for Franken foods, you know, for highly processed yeah. foods. But this one study, Uh, took two groups of people and one group of people, they just said, keep eating meat at every meal. Like just keep eating what you normally eat, like get your burgers and your fries and whatever you do. And then the other group, they said, keep eating what you eat, you know, keep eating the standard American diet, but you're going to replace five meals a week and five meals a week is nothing. Right. And five meals a week with some non meat Franken food. Right. So, so like beyond burger or, whatever, impossible burger. Um, and then they took their stool samples for a month. I don't know, maybe it was six weeks. I think it was six weeks, but they, they, it was a short, it was a short study. So yeah, it was six weeks and they looked at the microbiome and what they found is that, uh, eating the Franken foods, cause there's fiber they, in them, even though they're not healthy at all, they have canola oil and all kinds of GMOs and stuff. It's not, they're not healthy foods, but what's interesting is that by switching out some m- meat with something that had fiber in it. Now, these people weren't eating the way you and I eat. They weren't eating fresh fruits and vegetables and, or, you know, they weren't getting like proper fiber from whole food sources to begin with, but just adding in something that wasn't meat and instead had fiber in it increased the uh, butyrate uh, mm-hmm, butyrate, that right. was yep. that was made and which is which helps to digest and absorb um and also has other functions in terms of uh lowering heart disease so i thought that was incredible like just kind of blew my mind like 
that you, we, I'm sh- I thought, well, okay, we're not, we're not measuring, we're not taking blood because I want to see like maybe eating these Franken meats is going to increase inflammation because now they're getting more canola oil. But you know, th- they were told to just keep eating the standard, standard American diet, just replace some meat with something that has like fiber in it, right? The, the, the Franken meats. So I thought that was really interesting that if we could, you know, I, I'm a big I'm a big advocate of telling everyone to get fiber up to 40 to 50 grams a day yes. from whole food sources uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and, and, and just, and yeah, the first few weeks, maybe you're going to fart more, <laughs> maybe your, your microbiome is going to got to get catch up mm-hmm. and get used to it. But, oh my gosh, the difference it makes the difference. It's, it's such a huge, huge difference. Um, and then just to see that that study shows that even just uh, replacing meat with something that has fiber in it for a few meals a week was noticeable in the microbiome within six weeks. So it, it kind of gets exciting that you can make a, a health change, something small, like a baby step. Yeah. Maybe choose to – some people choose to um, eat vegetarian dinners or or they eat uh, – veg- you know, or you know, they choose to eat uh, more like – more plants – until 6 p.m. and then their dinner has meat in it or so, something. And um, I, so I, I personally have found because I've done over 30 diets um, to try mm. to find what works for my body, and it's a moving. I, I believe that I've come to the conclusion that diet is a moving target because your body's needs change as we as we age, as different under different stress under different circumstances, stress levels. So you got to listen to your body, right? And also, my body really resonates with the most whole food, plant-based possible. The more whole food, plant-based, the less processed food I, I eat, the more health my my body gains. Um, but I don't believe in diet dogma, and I and I don't tell everyone to eat the same way. But I do hmm. want I do want you to share what you've seen promotes the most health and makes the biggest difference. So like if everyone followed what you said, like avoid these foods and instead eat these foods for the next six weeks, we are going to see a big shift. So can you give us the, the, what is the, what is the, the sort of the biggest bang for our buck in terms of changing? So you've already said cut out, uh, or obviously GMO foods, obviously, you know, non-organic GMO foods, um, all the processed foods, the fried foods, the processed meats, the sugar, and um, and the the corn and soy. What else has a really um, big impact when it in, in terms of cutting cutting out of the diet? Well, I think you you nailed it a moment ago. You bring in uh, more plants with more fiber. Um, and it's interestingly enough, you know, the idea of gut health, digestion, assimilation is very key, and the uh, short chain fatty acid butyrate that is increased with good fiber intake is going to help heal the leaky gut and it works to mm. sort of bring about more repair to the tight junctions that get spread apart with the increase of that protein zonulin. So all that said, people can expect, and we've tracked data for a long time and we've got thousands of people in our database. This is what we've seen in only 30 days and we measure what's called body fat percentage so we're trying to get ladies down somewhere in the low 20s you know more or less percent body fat and men i want them below 15 or 15 or somewhere less than that and we see in one month the percent body fat drop two to four percent with ladies we've seen this consistently and the percent body fat went down three to five percent in one month with men and we've watched this occur over and over and over again and really it's about a body composition adjustment Uh, we know people have a hard time for four or five days if they have heavy addiction to this Mm. sugar grain thing but once they get past that four or five days their energy level goes up higher their sleep gets more effective and functional. Mm-hmm. The, the clothes fit uh, differently and the confidence goes through the roof. And that correlates well with reduction of stress because we now have confidence, which is a precursor for resilience, which is required to deal with stress. Now, um, to be clear, you are not promoting a vegan diet. Uh, I looked on your website. I saw that one of your smoothies had like beef, uh, 
protein powder in it. So, um, so what, what way of eating are you, um, promoting that gets these great results? Yeah. So we, we are not promoting a vegan diet. As a matter of fact, vegan diets typically lead to deficiencies in omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin B12, many times even iron as well. Um, to that end, um, we promote more of the quasi-Mediterranean diet, I would say, without breads and grains. And if you kind of keep that parameter there, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of plants, um, a lot of, you know, fruits and vegetables, of course. I want to stay away from the white potato, uh, more or less, the majority of the time, especially if you have had blood sugar issues and you have metabolic issues. And the white potato is the most polluted um, vegetable we consume in the United States mm. today. We consume more of that. Um, and then you you think about um, nuts and seeds. We want to get nuts and seeds that are not kind of raw, not rolled in and roasted in a lot of hot oils. That's mm -hmm. not healthy. Um, with proteins, I want to pick, you know, organic, grass-fed, wild-caught, free-range, um, those kind of things like that. You know, grass-fed, grass-finished is a cool uh, double term there to think about. But as long as you do that, you know, you're going to have good results. And even further, if you're saying, well, I, I'm going to have a hard time doing that um, just off the, the bat. I'm going to have a hard time flipping that light switch on. Okay, well, do one meal a day. That's right. One meal a day under these guidelines and you will feel better, much like you cited in the study that just add a little bit of fiber to a meat diet. One meal a day can change the microbiome and we know that mood can change because the, ser the neurotransmitter serotonin is produced primarily in the gut. Mm -hmm. And so people feel better. They're more calm. They're more confident. And so uh, you say it like this, small victories and small successes – lead to more successes and more victories. And if we just yes. take these steps one at a time, one at a time, and just commit to do one baby step every day to benefit us physically, emotionally, spiritually, just one thing, it's going to lead to two things. And it's going to lead to a lifetime of those things that are perpetual and habitual. And we will have a higher quality of life with the concept of wellness not being just a pipe dream, but being realized. Now, for someone who doesn't want to eat meat, um, they can eat, uh, can, can can they eat beans, you know, uh, legumes, uh, and and then and then supplement with with uh, like you said, they might end up with a deficiency. And there's meat eaters that have B12 deficiency too. So yes. saying that saying that a vegan. V vegan diet leads to that. I've, you know, I, I know plenty of meat eaters that are incredibly deficient in, um, yes. in, in, in their B12, but also in their intrinsic factor, which leads to B12 and iron deficiency. So, so it, we've got to, it, it all starts with the gut, right? We all have, we have yes. to heal the gut. So, um, you know, they could supplement with, uh, omega-3, um, if, you know, th to fill in the gap there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I do though say if you're going to eat if you're going to eat any bean or lentil to cook it in the instant pot, because pr under pressure, it, it, it breaks down the, um, the lectins. Yes. Uh, exactly. and, and, and then you don't fart as much. So, you know, and it's easier to cook it in the instant pot and just walk away from it. Um, so there's that. So do you have any like superfoods that are just like, if you, if you add this, people are going to get like, you know, sort of for brownie points, right? So, so some extra points yeah. there. Do you have any super, super, super foods that are going to like, let's say someone's walking around totally feeling inflamed. I, I know I, I've done it like once in a blue moon, I'm going to go out and, and like, I think like maybe five times in the last 11 years, I've been gluten-free. I've had like a slice of cake at a party or something and a glass of mm -hmm. wine. I really, I drink once a year. Like I go somewhere, birthday party somewhere and, uh, and it happens. And then the next day I'm walking around feeling a little, a little poopy, right? Mm -hmm, a little mm -hmm. inflamed. And, uh, and I, and I own it and I'm like, okay, you know, that was, I'm going to get back on, back on my eating healthy and, and I'll, I'll go to something like quercetin, turmeric, resveratrol, a big green smoothie, something that I know is going to like kick that inflammation in the butt. What do you have that kicks inflammation in the butt? You know, I really like the, um, Broccoli. If you can mm. take in broccoli, and this is why, because broccoli 
and even broccoli sprouts. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can take in broccoli sprouts, that'd be my number one of those two, Mm -hmm. because a sprout has a hundred times more density of nutrients than a full grown plant. What happens is when that broccoli sprout comes in, this is why I like it because it does so many things. There's, there's two compartments in the broccoli. One has something called glucoraphanin. The other has an enzyme called myrosinase. So when you chew this or digest this, these two compartments bust apart, combine together, and we get this um, wonderful compound called sulfurophane that is yielded inside the body. Well, sulfurophane upregulates the NERF2 pathway genetically, which will increase the antioxidant enzymes and your detox enzymes. So you're talking about a, a, a triple whammy in the ability to, to conquer this chronic systemic inflammation caused by the toxicity that is driven by the standard American diet. So think yielding sulfurophane. And to get that, broccoli sprouts or broccoli sprout uh, or, or broccoli. I love it. Now, cooked broccoli has the same effect or does it have to be raw? You know, it's the more you cook things, the more the um, the degradation occurs with anything. Mm-hmm. So obviously, you know, if if you can find some sprouts, if like, you know, raw broccoli can give some people gas, you know, it really. Yeah, can I just live with it. I know. Yes. Like, I love broccoli. I just I just have to like I just have to like be careful. Like if I'm going to go and do a meeting with someone, I'm not eating broccoli before that meeting. <laughs> Oh, yeah. You know, you don't want to do that because you're going to have um, awful gas pains and you let it out. It's probably going to smell bad. That's not <laughs> cool. Um, but honestly, I'd probably, you know, if you can find a way to grow some broccoli sprouts, yes, those don't do it as bad at all. And you can put those things on salads. Mm-hmm. And I haven't seen them cause that gas nearly as much as a full grown stock. It's really interesting. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, yes, on one hand, you want to cook less, but I get it. I'd really eat somebody eat cooked broccoli as in none, no broccoli. I have this health book, I, I, and I got to find it somewhere. I, 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 we just moved, so kind of my books aren't unpacked yet. But it's from like, I don't know, the 50s or something. It's like this old, old health book, and it's all about juicing for wellness, like way back before it's time, right? And uh, and it has a whole section on sprouting and how whenever you sprout, either you can sprout legumes, sorry, lentils, you can sprout lentils, you can sprout um, like beans, certain beans, like mung beans, not all beans, and then yep. seeds. Um, I've been really into sprouting seeds lately. And uh, I'll put I'll post a picture in, of last night's dinner. Uh, it, it was um, brown rice cake. That's my little guilty pleasure. <laughs> uh, the Ashley in her twenties would not think that that was a, a little cheat food, but my brown rice cakes uh, with avocado and piles and piles of uh, of sprouts on top, and it's really delicious to me. It's oh, like yeah. avocado mixed with sprouts is so good. I get I get like a dopamine high from eating it. So delicious. Um, and so sprouting is actually really easy. Go on YouTube, look it up. D- different, like different, different uh, types of seeds or beans or you know, d- different types call for sort of different times. But um, I found it really, really easy. And I'll, I'll, you know, in the in the the Learn to Health Facebook group, I'll make sure I post how I do it so that um, so that listeners that want to try it can do it for themselves. But it's, you know, it's so great because even in the winter, you can have fresh food. I had a guy on the show recently, Tim James, who says 70% of the food he eats, he grows in his house because he sprouts like no one's business. He has a whole wall of sprouts and and he mostly eats that. And and that's how he cured a lot of diseases he had and his friend cured cancer. His, his friend cured his cancer with it. Um, so he's a big proponent of eating live food, but just having sprouts in your house, it's so easy. You don't need sunlight. You just need a dark, a dark cupboard. I put it in the oven. Um, just got to remember it's in the oven and not start the oven. Cause that's how I started. <laughs> that's I, right. I, yeah. That's, that was a kitchen fire, uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, so my husband, and I now, now understand to, to, to always check the oven before we turn it on. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up that you, you talked about MSG, and I think it's really important that we not um, uh, gloss over that. That yeah. uh, because I just last night my friend told me about this video, Doctor Catherine Reed, 
was a TEDx talk, Unblind Your Mind. And she, it, it's a great video. Highly recommend everyone listen to it. And, and she shows clips of her autistic daughter who's in her own world, not the first video, in her own world, not making eye contact. Then they went, they chose to go gluten free and do a green smoothie every morning. And then she was, they saw neurological changes. Uh, they also went casein free. So all dairy, all dairy, all mm -hmm. gluten and do a green smoothie. So now we've upped the fiber, gotten a bit better gut health. And now she's able to make eye contact, but she's having two hour meltdowns where she's stuck in a yes, no loop. And I saw when my kid was younger, he did yes, no loops a little bit. Uh, and we, we would give him um, chamomilia um, homeopathic and it, it would take him out of it. Uh, but we, uh, but I noticed that. So then she was stuck in these loops and that's when she figured out, Dr. Reed figured out the problem was MSG and that the glutamate is so excessive in our processed food diet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that then she went through and made her child's diet 100% processed food free in order to eliminate there's MSG. There's 40 different words for MSG. So when you read the packaging, it can say soy protein, but it actually means MSG. And it, there's all these oh, different yeah, words right. for it, right? So so we might look at a package and think it's clean, but it's there's actually monosodium glutamate in it. And the, the problem is gl glutamate's good for us, right? But the problem is too much, right? So she she eliminated that. And then the last the last video, I my jaw was on the floor, is of a healthy, happy child making eye contact, speaking clearly and calmly and having a wonderful discussion about her kindergarten class. She was kicked out of her, her um, special needs class and put into a regular class. And so her daughter is no longer on the spectrum. And her daughter was, was diagnosed on the spectrum, uh, mo moderate autism, and now she has zero autism. And it was 100% wow. done with diet. And it was all about the doctor figured out that, that eating uh, wheat – Barley and rye, and in my and, and in my opinion, oats as well, because oats contain gliadin, which is yep. sim similar enough to gluten that I I I, I don't. I, it's kind of a lie when they say gluten free oats. I'm like, yes, but it has gliadin in it, so don't That's eat right. it. Um, it's it's by avoiding those grains, we are we are reducing glutamate. By taking out the processed food, we're reducing glutamate, and that affects the brain. It, it also affects the gut. So, so that is sort of this huge like wake up. I've never heard of this this standpoint because I've been dairy and gluten free for so long. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people see a benefit because they've reduced the free glutamate. That is so right. You know, you think about. Um glutamate being a neuro excitatory mm -hmm. uh, hormone. So we're talking about affecting the brain health. So you think about a, uh, an inflamed brain when you think of excess glutamate. So think brain inflammation. If, if you don't feel good in the brain, you're not going to make good decisions. So it's really, again, as we talked about at the top of our conversation, everything's connected. Mm -hmm. It's not segregated. It's connected. And because of that, just like you said correctly, we have to think about all these different effects it has all around our body. And they are significant, to say the least. Amazing. Amazing. It, you know, this has been so much fun having you on the show. And I absolutely would love to have you back to dive in deeper. I feel like this has been an introduction to the work you do. And I'd yeah. really love to get specific. It's especially specific on how to how to lower high blood pressure. Because yeah. A lot of a lot of, so a lot of patients are like I okay I get it I don't want to be on meds but my blood pressure is one sixty over one ten and and I'm taking medication so so yeah so what do I do so I'd love to you know have you on the show again we can discuss how to lower high blood pressure how to how to you know think about the most common commonly prescribed drugs that can be we can heal the body by doing these changes help like doing these lifestyle and diet changes to the point where the body is so healthy it doesn't need the drugs anymore mm -hmm. and so i'd really love to have you back on the show and dive into the most common drugs that you get your patients off of because you get them so healthy they no longer uh, sh are a candidate for them yeah i would love to come back let's do that and okay. talk about high blood pressure we can talk about um you know osteoporosis, that kind of yes. stuff as well. That's huge. Um, 
certainly we can talk about autoimmunity and reducing the ability to depend on those um, immune suppressants. I mean, there's all kinds of things, et cetera, et cetera, we can yeah. talk about. Let's do it. Yeah. So let's come up with a list of the most common drugs that you get people off of. And let's like go down that list and talk about the protocols and uh, wonderful. So all listeners can go to Sherwood.tv. Of course, the links to, doc- to Dr. Mark Sherwood and everything that he does and his wonderful wife does. Uh, uh, Michelle is going to be in the show notes of today's podcast at LearnTrail.com. And when you go to Sherwood.tv, go to the free download ebook. Twenty, I think it, didn't you say it was like 27 pages or something? Uh, but yes. it gives you some great uh, great protocols to start today. I love that your your mission is to continue to spread this information. Now, I also want to let listeners know you do have some great books. We didn't even get to talk about them today, so mm. we can definitely dive into that next time. I'd love to know maybe some tips from each of your books, Quest for Wellness, Fork Your Diet, <laughs> Surviving the Garden of Eaton, <laughs> Eaton, <laughs> not, not Eden, but Eaton. <laughs> That's cute. I love it. Um, and then, of course, watch the movie, the newly released movie, The Prayer List, which sounds fantastic. Mark, um, can you can you give us can you give us some homework to do between now and the next time we have you on the show? Yeah, I want people to uh, to to make a the list of what I'm going to give you right now, and I want you to do these these couple of things. It's not going to be much, but again, let's celebrate small victories. So, I want people to work on having at least a 15 minute walk every day. That's number one. Okay, number two, I want people to work on seven to eight hours of sleep every night. That's very important. I want people to work on having a salad uh, once a day, just one salad, once a day. That That's beautiful. Number four, I would like to challenge people to come up with a, a two or three sentence positive affirmation that they speak out loud over their life twice a day. For example, it can be, you know, I am a loving being. I am worthy. I am successful. There you go. There's three things right there. Say that out loud twice a day, every day. And do those couple of things that I just named off. Do them between now and the next time we talk and watch your life change. Watch how those small little things lead to bigger changes. And no matter where you are in your health journey, whether you're um, just getting going on it or whether you've just been into this, look, we all have improvement. So you can take those things right there and you can improve them based upon where you are. But I've given you a little bit of homework that you can do every day. It doesn't take much time. You're talking, you know, just a little bit of time and thought. And we get 1,440 minutes a day. So why can't we spend a little bit of time on self-development so we can make the world a better place? Beautiful. And we're starting with ourselves and then we, we expand out our friends, our family, our community, you know, our neighborhood, our community, our county, our state or province, right? Our country and the world. And uh, we have to think of, of, of all of our choices in that ecological way. Because if our choice is harming ourself, it's, it's trickling down. It's harming our children. You know, yes. going to, I always pick on McDonald's, right? There's, but there's such an easy target, but going to, going to fast food restaurant, like in the moment it's easy. Cause I'm tired. I'm hungry. My kids are hungry. I'm just going to go through the drive through that easy choice, right? We have to choose our hard, right? I, we have to, we have to just choose our hard. Maybe our heart is, is getting that salad, uh, and, and doing it. But once we do it, it's going to, it's going to fill you with so much energy that then you're going to want to do it again and again. But choosing your hard, you're not your the good choices are trickling down to those you love, and the bad choices are also trickling down to those you love. So, yes. so we have to remember that, especially as women, because we like to put our kids first and put everyone first, and then we're left just hungry and tired and just doing takeout. And I, I've been there. Just trust me, I, I get it. And ultimately, harming ourselves harms those we love. Um, so we, we, we've got like, you know, you don't want to imagine a world where you're not here anymore and your children don't have you, right. Or your spouse doesn't have you or your fa- family to, or friends don't have you because we kept putting ourselves last. Right. That's so right. I love these little, these little things, a uh, 15 minute walk, eight hours of sleep. And, and also it, it matters when you go to bed. I just want to point out that if you go to bed at one in the morning, uh, versus 10 at night. So, so at, at 10 30 at night. 
we get a cortisol spike and that makes it yeah. hard to stay in a deep sleep all night long. So it'll actually affect the depth of our sleep and when we wake up. So we'll end up, and maybe you notice this with your children, if you let them stay up late, they'll actually wake up early in the morning. You're like, why didn't, why didn't you sleep in? But same with us, we'll have a lighter, restless sleep. So if you go to, you got to make sure you fall asleep by 10 so that you don't have that second wind. You don't have that cortisol spike. And then you have deeper, more restful sleep. You wake up seven to eight hours later feeling way more rested. Um, so yeah, that's, I love that. And then you want us to eat one salad a day filled with lots of wonderful vegetables and hopefully some broccoli sprouts. And then, and then using that positive affirmation is beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Can't wait to have you back. This has been wonderful. I can't wait to come back either. It's an honor to be here with you today and I look forward to it. I truly do.